So based on the course schedule today, we will be having, uh, I want to finish KKT and quadratic programming. And uh, next week, uh, my postdoc, uh, Dr. Patel, he will come to the class because I yeah, I am a judge somewhere. I cannot be in the classroom. So he will be here, and uh, we have project teams. Um, we have project teams. These are the project teams. Uh, you guys can use this week to, to discuss what you are trying to work on. And next time when the postdoc comes, he will have discussions with you and he may be arranging his own way to have this open discussion and uh, uh, he will give you comments on what you plan to work on. So uh, let's finish constraint optimization this week. Next week you will be talking about the the, top, the project, and a week later, on the 29th, you will be giving proposal presentations. So basically, I will be sitting down there, and each team come up, uh, giving a, a presentation of the proposal based on some PowerPoint you prepared. Um, so please prepare a PowerPoint. That's easier for me to understand better what you are trying to work on. And starting from, basically starting from next week, you, you will be working on your project. And for after the proposal week, I will be talking about some of the advanced topics in optimization. Then uh, we are approaching the, the last couple of weeks of, the, uh, of this course. On 27th of, uh, of May, I will be traveling to an international conference. So my postdoc will come here again to uh, have a final discussion with each team. Similar style to next week, but uh, on May 27th, I believe most of you will be maybe 90% done with your project. So we, on that day, you can uh, have maybe uh, good discussions with the postdoc so you can uh, fine tune your final project. And on the uh, 3rd of June, you will be giving the final presentation of your project. So, similar style to the proposal, but uh, what's different is that on June 3rd, you should be presenting something with some good results. Okay, so that's the idea. Now let me move on to today's lecture. Uh, okay, 
So we are going to talk about so-called the KKT condition. So what is KKT? Actually, you can Google for it. Uh, so basically, KKT stands for three people's names. Karaj, Kun, and Tucker. Okay, so uh, if you want to know more about the history of KKT conditions, you can actually get information from the internet. But here I'm not going to talk about uh, how they come up with this. I'm just going to uh, let you know what are the KKT conditions. Okay, so back to the slide. Uh, so the idea is for general optimization problem, you're minimizing f of x. You can have uh, multiple x, multi-dimensional problem. And you can have a bunch of uh, inequality constraints. Uh, over here, I would like to start with equality ones. So, I goes from 1 to M, okay? So you have M equality constraints, and then you have a bunch of inequality constraints, and the index goes from M plus 1 to N, okay? You have basically, uh, in total, N constraints. Um, in order to make it, um, let me see. I should talk about, ah, here. I should talk about, yeah, so in order to handle a general problem like this, we want to consider a simpler one. So let's only focus on a simpler version. So over uh, at the end, we want to handle a general problem like this, where we have uh, equality constraint and also inequality. But uh, we need to talk about something simpler first. So what's a simpler problem? The simple, simpler one is the one with equality only, okay? So let's talk about the uh, equality constraint optimization. Um, so since the constraints are equality constraints, you have to satisfy it. You need to find solutions on top of the constraint because that constraint has to satisfy. Then um, during the optimization pro process, we may have solutions in different iteration. And let's say we have solutions in the k and k plus 1 iterations. And they are basically x of k and x of k plus 1, right? And we hope both of them will satisfy the equality constraint. Otherwise, our optimization uh, process may, may be chaos. We may bump into somewhere that is not satisfying the constraint. We may not come back. So we, we want these two to satisfy all the time. We want this to happen. So, uh, and based on what we have learned, in 
especially for the gradient-based approach, uh, we seems to have approach like this, where we have a new optimization point that equals to the previous one plus some kind of moving direction. Either it's a, a, a Newton's method, conjugate gradient, steepest descent. We, we almost every, in, in all kinds of method, we try to start from somewhere that we know and then try to move to a new position. And the movement, you can define it as a, a D vector. It's like a, a moving direction, right? So uh, if we can make sure, so, so, so this implies we are trying to get this. If we, if we plug in, which we hope, even if we move by this vector of D, we still uh, satisfy the equality constraint. Okay, um, so that's the idea. Now uh, we want to do some derivation over here. We are going to do, um, let me see. We're going to do, uh, let me see, which one? Ah, Taylor expansion. Let's try Taylor expansion of your uh, H, basically HI of X at k plus 1. Let's try this. So, if I do tail expansion, basically, uh, we are choosing, let me see, um, Choosing which point as the expansion point. Let me see. Um, yeah. So we are choosing the current variable as the expansion point. So at the end, it's gonna be like this, right? gradient of h i at the expansion point. So we choose this, uh, yes, this one, and this one. They are basically the expansion point. Right? And since we have this relationship, so this part can be replaced. We can rewrite the, the above equation as plus the green one basically is d vector the product with the Asian, uh, the, the, the gradient, right? Okay, so we want this two equals to zero, and also we know this is already zero because uh, where we are, we want uh, our current design point satisfy the constraint, and uh, we want the new point satisfy the constraint as well. So with these two rules. Uh, we end up with a new equation, basically is a d vector down product with a gradient equals to zero. 
Okay? So if we can, during the process, whenever we uh, try to move our design point to a new position by a, a directional vector, if that directional vector satisfies this rule, then we can be sure, or we are quite confident, uh, at the new position, we still can satisfy the equality constraint. Okay? So, this keeps our optimization feasible. If our starting point is feasible, then that means our starting point satisfy the equality constraint here. If this is a starting point and it is satisfied. If I can find uh, some good moving direction D, and the good moving direction D satisfy this rule D the product with the gradient H equals to zero, then I can guarantee the second equation satisfied. So my new point remains feasible. So this equation help us keep the feasibility of the optimization process. Okay, so this equation keeps a, keep us feasible all the time. Keep the design point feasible. Okay, now uh, in optimization, we not only need to have feasible solution all the time, we also want to have lower objective function value. If the objective function value is not reducing, then you are not optimizing, right? Because we are minimizing f sub subject to equality constraint equals to zero. If you only find point on the uh, equality constraint, but not making the objective function value lower, then you are not optimizing, you are not improving. So we still want to, we, we keep on trying to find lower function value. So how can we uh, keep the uh, objective function value lower? The idea is we can try Taylor expansion, same thing, uh, of the objective function. So similarly, you will have your objective function like this. This time I am uh, making it faster, so this is a d vector basically. So this is your objective function. And this is the objective function value for your current design. And this one is the objective function value of the new design. You want the new design to be lower. The new F becoming lower. So how can you make your optimization getting better and better? If this guy is negative, then you are always reducing the F. So this equation equal, let me rewrite it. D dot gradient F. This keeps the optimization, uh, keep the object function value lower. So we, we call this optimality. So in optimization, you want to develop certain procedures so that you are always uh, keeping two factors, feasibility and optimality. If you can always uh, making sure your process maintain feasibility and optimality, eventually you can find a solution because Feasibility allows you to stay on the right track 
and your solution is always feasible and optimality helps you to find newer points such that the uh, object function value drops. So one day you will reach to a position so that uh, uh, you cannot improve further. So that must be the optimal. It's a position where you can, you can find the lowest objective function value f and still uh, being feasible. So you cannot do better. That's the, that's the end. That's the final end goal. So if you can keep on doing this, you should be able to find an optimal solution. So that's the idea. Um, So um, this equation So now we are going to uh, take a look at both of these equations. Okay, so uh, Let me see how I can prove this. There's a proof, but it's very difficult to understand. So I'm trying to find an easier way. Okay, so maybe by a graphical approach. So let's say I have a 2D problem, x1 and x2, and I have a, a straight line. Let's say this is h of x equals to 0, and I have some kind of contour like this. Okay? And this is the objective function f, uh, not equal, just contour of f. And going this way, going this way, uh, this is so called a descent direction, going down, right? Descent. Descent direction. Steep is descent, right? Going down. So, by observation, you can see, okay, this should be the optimal because on the straight line, that probably is the location with the lowest objective function value. Okay, so uh, you may start with somewhere here. This could be your uh, x of k, and this could be your x of k plus 1. So in this case, where is your d? d is like, uh, let me change the color. d is like this. This is your d. Okay? And what is the direction of your gradient? So for f, f of h, the gradient is usually perpendicular to your constraint, so this is actually the gradient direction. It's either going left lower corner or upper right, but it's always perpendicular. So this is your h of, a gradient of h at xk. So from here you can see why d dot product with gradient h equals to zero because they are perpendicular. Okay? Now, uh, what is the direction of uh, gradient f? Basically, perpendicular to the contour, but uh, going toward the direction where function value increases. So that would be here. 
So this is gradient F. Okay? From this figure you can tell D vector and the gradient F has an angle that is larger than 90 degrees. So if you do dot product, it's going to be some value that is negative. Okay? So your D vector is trying to move on the opposite direction of gradient F. So it's moving toward negative gradient F direction so that your object function value drops. Okay? So, um, let me see. So, the um, gradient of H and gradient F right now has no unique relationship. But what's interesting is that when the uh, solution point reaches close to the, uh, to the optimal, let's see what will happen. So let me draw uh, something like this, and you will see something interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing the straight line again x1 and x2 and I'm drawing the contour but this time I am drawing the contour in this way I am specifically uh, plotting one of the contour that is tangent to the uh, uh, straight line okay so basically you just draw the same contour of objective function but at different level so now I'm drawing one of the curve that is tangent to the red line so that level is having the uh, so basically your optimal is right here right it was just like uh, in the earlier case i didn't draw the curve that is tangent to the optimal point but this time i'm drawing it so on top of this level, the objective function value is the same as the optimal point. Okay, so uh, here, this is your optimal. Okay, this is your objective function contour. This is your constraint contour. Okay, so what happened? If you zoom in very closely, if you zoom in very closely, it's like uh, you are uh, somewhere. This is somewhere. Uh, maybe this is your still the X, or you can say this is your X star, if you zoom in very closely, and, and you try to move a little, a, little, a little bit toward right. So you can say uh, this is x star plus some d vector, but, but right now d is super small, almost close to zero. So it's like you are reaching toward the final iteration, or you are just about to converge. And you can even say these two points are just the same point. D is so small. But if you treat it like a, a, a very tiny movement, then it's a movement like this. And at this situation, if you try to plot out the gradient of H and Arjuna function, um, for the gradient of H, it's like I have drawn is perpendicular to A, to, to the red line. And at, at, at this point, it's already uh, well close to the optimal. So it's like uh, our gradient is like here, okay? And 
And what's interesting about the gradient of f is that because the contour is like this, tangent to the point, so when we are very close or right on the optimal, our um, position x star is actually right at the tangent point. So if you try to evaluate the gradient of f on that, on that x star, in that case, we also have perpendicular vector gradient f at x star. So both of them are parallel to each other, right at the tangent point. Earlier, we, when we are not at the optimal, the objective function is having a gradient that is not uh, at the same direction as gradient of h. Okay, these two are not parallel to each other. But when we move toward the optimal, when we are very close, or when we are on top of the x star, because it's a tangent point. So if you take a uh, gradient, you basically try to evaluate uh, its uh, uh, um, basically it's a gradient direction. Gradient direction is always perpendicular to the function contour. So at this case, in this case, even if your red function is a nonlinear function at this particular location, because d is so small, d the gradient of h is also perpendicular to to the red curve. So we don't even need to worry about how nonlinear f or h are at this particular local position, the gradient of h is perpendicular to the red one, and the gradient of f is perpendicular to the contour. So, and they are parallel to each other. Okay? So if that's the case, then we can write one equation like this. So what does it mean? The vector of gradient f is uh, equals to some lambda times the vector of h. So they are linear. They are having a linear relationship. So these two vectors are parallel with each other, but we have we don't need to be sure what's the size of them, the length of them. They they, they don't need to have the same length but they have the same direction. So in this case, we use a lambda, a, a, a multiplier in front of it, just to uh, describe their relationship. So this lambda is so-called the Lagrangian multiplier. Lagrangian multiplier. Okay. So what if we have a case where we have multiple constraints? Then this relationship still is still valid if we have multiple constraints. But we need to make a little, uh, we need to upgrade the equation in this form. So this is the case when we have multiple constraints. So you, you just have a summation of those lambda i gradient h terms. But in this case, you have multiple lambda. If you have 10 equality constraints, then you have 10 equality constraints. So you have 10 Lagrangian multipliers. Okay? So this is a, a general equation at the end. Okay. So this idea 
will lead us to the KKD condition. Okay, this is a important idea uh, to start. Any questions? Okay. Uh, you probably have no idea, okay, why, why do we need this? Last time we talked about how KTT condition can help us to check whether the optimal solution is optimal. So uh, from here you can tell this equation is satisfied only if the solution is optimal. So this obviously can help us to check whether your solution is the optimal for a problem like this, a simple problem like this. So there's no inequality constraint yet. However, in general, we may have inequality constraints G. So we need to expand what we have, what I have talked about, and formulate a more general uh, uh, rules, general equations, so that those equations could be the conditions to check whether the solution is the optimal for a general problem like this. So what I'm going to do that right now. Okay? Now, uh, back to the problem with inequality constraint. Uh, one way to make uh, the general problem uh, easy to handle is to introduce slack variables. Because when we introduce slack variables, our inequality constraints become equality constraint. And we already have this equation for equality constraint. So adding slack variables obviously is a good way to, to, to work. So that's introduce slack variables to the general problem. Basically with, with the G functions. Okay? So after we do that, we will be solving a minimization problem subject to uh, we still have all the equality constraints where i goes from 1 to m and we will be having our g functions, gi and we are adding new variables as j but this time I'm putting a square right here so we are making sure the select variable is positive because in the past we when we add select variables, we wish the select variables are positive. If you have a square right here, you are sure right here the select variable is always positive or zero. Okay? And j goes from n plus 1 to n. Okay? So this is an equivalent problem uh, from the original problem original uh, problem. Because, uh, you know, adding select variables doesn't change the problem. It, it's an equivalent problem. But you will be introducing more variables. That's only a uh, difference, is that you are having more variables. Okay. Now, since the uh, HI and all the uh, inequality constraints now become equality constraints. We can kind of merge them. We can, mer we can merge them. Okay? After the merging, we are going to call them H hat. And I goes from 1 to N. So we just rename them, merge them together. Okay, so if we merge them, now we only deal with this. Right? 
This is after merging. And we already know about the rules for, uh, we, already, we, we know about the Lagrangian equality on the top. So that must be valid after we rewrite the general problem in this form. So again, we are going to follow what we have talked about uh, earlier and apply it to this new new problem right here. So we will have gradient f of x at the optimal plus summation of lambda i gradient h hat uh, yeah, x of star equals to zero. This is exactly what we had at the top. But this time I am putting the uh, lambda to the left hand side. It's the same. Basically lambda becomes negative lambda. It's just a coefficient. Lambda can be positive or negative, it, it doesn't matter. Okay? So it's easier for me to do further derivation if we put everything everything on the left hand side. Okay, so if we put them together, now uh, maybe we should expand uh, the equation and write down the details the, uh, of this general equation. So I would like to um, write this, uh, rewrite or derive further on this equation. So I'm specifically uh, trying to study the, um, I, I don't want to use J, let me use, because uh, I used J earlier, maybe I use K. I, we don't have K here, yeah. So let's use K. The K variable. How about the partial deriv derivative with respect to the k of x? Okay, so this is plus. Uh, so this time we can have lambda i and uh, partial uh, h i over partial x k. Right? And i goes from 1 to n. And also, partial derivative of uh, also lambda i, but this time we have gj, or we can use i, gi, uh, plus si square. It's just index xk, but i here goes from m plus 1 to n, right? So I'm just plugging in the original equation into the h hat, okay? And to separate lambda i for the h and the lambda i for g, uh, we would like to rename this part as mu i. Just a different name. So, so they are separate. For the equality constraint, we use lambda. For the inequality <coughs> constraint, we use a different symbol. It's mu. It doesn't matter. Okay. So, uh, after that, we uh, we do what? Okay. So. Let's focus on this partial derivative, <coughs> this one. Does S has anything to do with X? S is the select variable. It's a newly introduced variable. It has no relationship with X. It's not a function of X. So the partial derivative of S 
with respect to xk equals to zero. Okay? So you can then rewrite the whole thing because uh, you know this part is zero. The partial derivative of the si squared part actually equals to zero because s is not a function of xk. Okay, so the partial derivative of si with respect to xk is zero. So we can rewrite the whole thing again. It's better if I use J. Yeah. Because originally it was J. The index was J. Because I goes from 1 to N, J goes from N plus 1 to N. They may have different numbers. So it's less confusing if I use J this time. Okay? So in this equation, you can tell. There are different terms of HI and different terms of different amount of HI, different amount of GJ. So you have different numbers of lambda I and different numbers of mu J. Okay? So this is the first equation for KKD condition actually. Now uh, when we when we uh, take the gradient, actually we need to take gradients. We need to take partial derivative with respect to all the variables. So what I have written right here are the partial derivatives with respect to all the x. So here, basically, for k from 1 to the number of variables, right? So you may have a bunch, let me define, define, uh, let's say, capital N. So capital, o, capital N is the number of variables. So over here, you have N of those equations. But at the beginning, when we introduce select variables, there are more variables being introduced, not just the n x, n x variables. We have new variables, all the s. So how many s right here? There are this many of s being newly added to the general equation. So when we take the gradient, that means we need to do partial derivatives with respect to all the si as well. So let's try to do that. We need to do s s s j s that we need to do this as well. Okay, so uh, we will have. S J and uh, here's J. We already make it mu J. So G J S J square over S J. This must be valid as well. So what in the entire equation what is related to S? F has nothing to do with S. H has nothing to do with S. G has nothing to do with S. So actually, all these terms are zero. And this part is zero. Because they are 
they have nothing to do with, with S. So at the end, what is related to S? The S itself. So we will have uh, 2 mu j S j equals to 0. Right? That's the only thing that is related to, specifically, only S j is related to S j. The S j plus 1 has nothing to do with j, S j. So only that particular one, S j, is related to S j. So S j squared, if you take a derivative, is going to be 2 S j. And of course, there's a multiplier here. So that's why you have 2 times mu j times S j equals to 0. And of course, this implies mu j S j equals to 0 for all the j's. J goes from n plus 1 to n, like we introduced at the beginning. OK? So that's our second rule, second KKT condition. Uh, there's another one. How do we have it? Ah, but why why do we why can't we stop right here? Because in the general problem, there's no s. In the original problem, there's no slack variables. The original problem is right here. When we look at the original problem, there's no slack variables. You don't want to truly introduce slack variables all the time. You want to have KTT condition equations that can be utilized for the original problem, not the select variables. That's why we cannot stop there. Even if we have mu j s j equals to zero, but we don't like it. We want to do more. We want to rewrite it in a new way, so we don't need to um, we don't need to look at it anymore. So in order to replace this mu j s j equals to zero, we, wa we are going to uh, we're going to we're going to do something. Let's see what do we do. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So we are going to revisit the entire problem in a uh, 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 some approach that we have done earlier. So that's say we have a moving direction is so-called a feasible perturbation. So basically, it's like a tiny movement at x star, just like what we mentioned right here. If we have a tiny movement from the x star to somewhere uh, next to it, but remaining feasible. So if we have a D like this, then to maintain optimality, we said earlier we have found the D vector that product with the gradient of F at the uh, x star, of course. Um, we are at x star, so I don't need to write it down. Right here. This has to be uh, negative, isn't it? Do we say negative? Ah. 
Okay. Uh, it's slightly different from what we talked about earlier. So, he, this over here is positive. I, I will tell you why. So, earlier we had uh, a, a equality constraint here. Here's h equals to zero. And we have uh, objective function contour like this, right? And we had some point right here. This is SK, and here is XK plus one. And uh, we said, okay, this is my D vector. So if this is the case, um, your gradient, your gradient G, uh, uh, gradient F, this is your F. Gradient F is like this direction at this particular point. So earlier, we want our D is moving far away. I mean, on the opposite direction of gradient F. So you are moving toward a negative gradient. Right? That's what we talked about earlier. But now, in this case, we are right at the optimal solution. So we are here. This is your X star. And if we move a little bit toward right, this is my D. And uh, here is my gradient. Uh, gradient F. Right? So in this case, do we still want uh, this movement to be, do we still want these two angles to be larger than 90 degrees? So, You can observe this with various conditions. So this is the situation where we have equality constraint. So in this case, they are perpendicular. So in this case, equals to zero, right? But for inequality constraints, that means you have uh, a, a like a wall, so this is your g smaller than zero. Uh, on the wall is equals to zero. Over here is g positive, here is g negative. So here is feasible. In this case, and at some optimal right here. Uh, this is your x star. If you take the, if so, which what is the direction of gradient g? Uh, it's going to be this way, toward the positive side. So this is your gradient g at the optimal. So what would be your uh, feasible perturbation. You can move your point to here. You can move your point to here. You can move your point to here. Your D can be any of those green vectors, but very small. But your green vector cannot be cannot be this one. This is not, not good. Because the black one 
goes into the invisible space. So you can only allow small perturbation on like those of the green vectors. And what's the angle between the green vectors and the blue? It's either 90 degree or larger than 90. So in this case, the dot product between them is either zero or, oh, hold on. That is negative. Hmm. Am I thinking this right? Uh, gradient direction going positive. Hmm. What did I do? Okay. Let me check my notes. Is it right? If I do this, if I do a Taylor expansion, so this must be the smallest. So this is a little larger. That means the... is positive. Maybe proving this way is easier. Trying to use a graphical way to explain it. Somehow it doesn't. Uh, If it's the equality constraint, sometimes the objective function gradient is not always, uh, you may not have the tangent situation. Ah, that's why, that's why. So it's harder to uh, use a graphical way to prove uh, this part. So to, to show you this part is positive or zero, the easiest way is use Taylor expansion. Okay? Uh, 
Okay, so the 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 graphical proof on the right hand side doesn't help much. Okay, so we know for optimality we want this. How about for feasibility? Okay, feasibility. Earlier we already said we want this uh, HI and uh, at the optimal. This remains, we want this to be zero. So, uh, just like the drawing on the right, upper right corner, uh, the gradient of H would be perpendicular to my D all the time. So this drawing on the right hand side actually helped me to show this one. This is GJ. This one is smaller than or equals to zero. So what I tried to explain earlier actually helped me to explain why the D dot product with gradient G is either zero or negative. Because over here, the green dot product with the blue is either zero or negative. Right? Because the angle is either 90 degree or larger than 90 degree. Because in order to be stay feasible, your your slight perturbation from X star can only be somewhere on the green. You cannot move to the X because small perturbation toward the invisible space that doesn't that is not valid. But you can have a small perturbation toward the feasible space. So all those green dots are okay. And those green vectors are the D. That product with the gradient of G, in this case you can tell, is either zero or negative. So we need those to uh, talk about uh, to talk about uh, this particular one. The first red box, we want to do something with it. Let me call this equation one and call this equation two. Okay? The two red boxes. We're going to do something with the the uh, first one. So let's have a dot product with the first one. Okay, let's see what will happen. At the end we will have gradient F at the optimal plus uh, summation lambda i d the product with gradient h i at the optimal plus summation j uh, mu j d the product at gradient of g j at the optimal okay we want this, this is equals to zero because what we had earlier was zero even if we have a pre-multiplier of d is still zero, right? In this case, we can um, put in what we, we, we found from the optimality and feasibility. This guy is positive or zero, this guy is zero, and this guy is smaller than or equal to zero. Okay, so this implies a what? In this equation, the first term is either zero or positive. Okay, so uh, it's not it's never negative. The second term is always zero. The third term you have something that is negative with a pre-multiplier. So, in order to make this equation zero, the pre 
Gaussian multiplier has to be positive. Is it? When everything, when everything is zero, then of course mu j can be anything. But if some of the terms, like the first one is positive, then I need something negative in the back. So positive plus negative equals to zero. So the mu j has to be positive. Is that a, or maybe we can say this. Maybe we can have mu one d plus da da da. We have. Uh, just put an index here. Many of these terms, and then it goes to negative of this. And they are all negative. This if you move it to the right hand side, then this is negative. So, can any of the mu j be negative? J be negative. Of course, in some situation, all the mu equals to zero. If every equation and every of those terms equals to zero, then uh, no, no, no. If all the terms are, they could be, um, they could be either positive. Negative or zero. Ah, so in general, on the left hand side, in all kinds of situations, uh, each of the terms could be non zero. So no matter how many turns on the left hand side, uh, you have one way to be, make sure this equation is always valid is to make sh is to keep all the mu's either zero or positive. Then you are one hundred percent sure the left hand side is either zero or negative. And that is having the same sign as the right hand side. Right? Because we are deriving something in general. You cannot allow any particular situation so that uh, this equation is not valid. So the only way to make this equation to be valid is to make sure on the left hand side it's always negative or zero. And the only way to do it is to make sure all the mu's is either zero or positive. Okay. So in this case, all the mu i's, this implies all the mu's has to be zero or positive in general. If this is happening, then this equation is always valid. Okay. So that would be uh, equation three. Now, uh, we haven't touched the equation 2 yet. So for equation 2, we are going to do something. Equation 2 tells me 
mu j as j equals to zero. Mu j as j equals to zero. Okay. So uh, from the select variable, we said as a g j plus s j squared equals to zero. This is what we had at the beginning. We can have some discussion to uh, uh, to cover all the possible situations. One of the situations is that s j is not zero, or s j equals to zero. So let's see what will happen. When s j equals to zero, then you are sure g j has to be zero, right? How about when s j is not zero? In this case, mu j has to zero. Right? Because sj is not zero. So, because we, we already derived mu j sj equals to zero, so mu j has to, zero, be, has to be zero. So, in the, if we want uh, all the equation to be valid all the time, either mu j equals to zero or gj equals to zero. It's either way. Now, only two possible situations. One of it must be happen. So this implies mu j g j equals to zero. They could be zero at the same time, or one of it could be zero. And mu j g j equals to zero describe this kind of situation. Either one of it is zero or they are zero at the same time. So this will be my fourth equation. And the advantage of this equation is that you no longer need to talk about SJ. So overall, we conclude with the KKT condition. For a general problem, minimizing f of x subject to h i of x equals to zero, g of j equals uh, smaller than or equals to zero. For a general problem, the KKT conditions are the first one partial f partial x k plus summation lambda i partial h i partial x k plus mu j partial g j partial x k summation of i summation of j equals to zero so k equals to one to m here i could be one to small m J, uh, earlier I said m plus 1 to n, but here in a more general format, you can say 1 to n. You can have n of m, okay? It doesn't matter. Okay, second equation, mu j g j equals to 0, and of course, j equals to 1 to n. The third equation is all the mu j must be positive or equals to 0, j from n to 1 to n. So that would be the conclusion, KKT conditions. OK? OK. Now, uh, today we derived how to uh, how to do KKD conditions. Uh, let's take a five minute break and I will let you to you know, digest a little bit. Okay. If you have questions, uh, five minutes later we can discuss about your questions.
So we covered the KKD condition. And KKD conditions are uh, in many situations being utilized for uh, derivations of new algorithms. So I'm going to now move on to quadratic programming. In quadratic programming method, it actually utilizes some of the uh, equation that we had from KKD condition. So let's now talk about quadratic programming. Okay, here. So, quadratic programming. Earlier we talked about linear programming and why this one is called quadratic programming? Because we can handle nonlinear constraints, nonlinear functions. So the idea for quadratic programming is that it will formulate a general equation like this. I will explain what's going on. Okay, so for quadratic programming, it handles nonlinear optimization problem in this format. So over here, for the ability function, it's being approximated by second order tail extension. Okay, and for the Inequality and the equality constraints it has been linearized by the first order Taylor extension. So that's the standard format for this method. It handles a problem in this way. But if you have higher order functions, it's okay, just Taylor expansion. So the solution of your QP problem won't be the true solution if, if one of your constraints or one of the functions is nonlinear. Your solution for QP may just be somewhere close to the true solution, not yet the true one. So you may need to do, do a sequential procedure. So that's why earlier when I talked about linear programming, I talk about sequential linear programming where you have linear approximation at current point, you get the solution, then you use the solution to take first order approximation again, solve it, solve linear programming, and use a new solution to take uh, tail expansion again until this whole thing converges. Sim similar procedure here, if you are doing sequential quadratic programming, you will have second order Taylor expansion for F, linear Taylor expansion for constraints, perform QP, you will get a solution. Use that new point to do expansions again, and sequentially improving until everything converges. But Today we are focusing on QP only. We assume you 
already approximate the whole thing in the standard form, and we don't we don't talk about the sequential part yet. Just focus on QP. Now, why do we have so called the one half of x h x plus c x after second order giant expansion? Why do we have that? So if you take a look at the second order Taylor expansion of a function, in general, you would have something like this. This is second order Taylor extension for multi-dimensional function. Over here you can see this is a constant. Also this term is a function. Right? And also these terms. Constant. So in optimization, if you are solving, for example, minimizing x squared plus 1, the solution is 0. Because when x equals to 0, x squared plus 1 is the smallest. If you are solving x squared plus 2, the solution is still 0. If you are solving x squared, the solution is still x equals to 0. So the constant term does nothing in optimization. It doesn't change your optimal solution. So usually when we are deriving, we don't even care about the constant terms. If you care about the true value of your f, plug in into the constant later on. So in derivation, we usually just throw away all the constant terms. So that's why you will have something like this, x times your gradient. So your gradient vector basically is a vector. In the general formulation, it's c, a c vector. So over here, this is this part. Okay? Basically, some vector times x. How about this one? x times x times your Hasian. Basically here, x times Hasian times x. Okay? The rest are just constant. Okay? So now you understand why the general form formulation looks like that. Okay? Uh, yeah, basically like this. Now we can work on the KKD condition. Okay? What does KKD tell us? We have something called Lagrange. Oh, before we do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have so-called Lagrangian, and then derivative gradient of Lagrangian equals to zero. So what is Lagrangian? Mm -hmm. In KKT condition, this actually is so-called uh, uh, gradient of Lagrangian equals to zero. So what is Lagrangian? Lagrangian. Actually, sometimes we just write it as L equals to F plus summation of lambda i h i plus summation of mu j g j. That's Lagrangian. Lagrangian doesn't have to be zero, but the gradient of Lagrangian needs to be zero. Okay, so. Let's formulate Lagrangian first in 
QP format. So for Lagrang Lagrangian is your F, yes, here, uh, plus you will have, um, in, in my derivation, I'm going to use U vector, dot product with G, plus V vector, dot product with H, and we need something called W vector, dot product with negative X, Y. Why do we have that? So, G, uh, U right here is basically mu. Well, because we have so many, so we don't want to deal with the Greek symbols. So this time we use U, V, W. So the Lagrangian multiplier for G is U. The Lagrangian multiplier for H is V. And Lagrangian multiplier for this particular one is W. Even X is larger than or equals to zero. It's actually a inequality constraint. So this one you can write it as a general form. Negative x is smaller than zero. So you want to have a pre-multiplier w times negative x. Okay? So Lagrangian is like this. What's next? Uh, Okay, so we will need multiple equality equations. There is already one equality equation, this one. We don't even need to do anything on the H. So that one, we will, we don't need to uh, modify it. That one is going to be utilized later on. When we are, we need to collect many of those and then put everything together. And the goal is, once we have a bunch of equality equations, we're going to solve it just like a linear programming problem. Okay? So, that's one equation. The other one is, we need to do gradient Lagrangian equals to zero. So, let's try to do it. Uh, our f, our f is one half of x times h times x plus c x. If we do partial derivative with respect to x, at the end we will have uh, take this part away. You have h x. Another one, you take the derivative of this one, you have also have hx, so 2 of hx. And you have a pre-multiplier of 1 half, so 2 times 1 half equals to 1. So at the end, the, this term, partial derivative of this term with respect to x equals to hx. So this one is hx. The other term is Cx, if you take derivative with respect to x, at the end is C, so plus C, okay? Now, uh, second term, U times G, so what's inside G? G is Ax minus B, so Ax minus B, only thing that is related to x is A. So you will have a pre-multiplier of U and a matrix of A. So it's A times U, okay? So at the end is A times U. How come the transpose disappear? So this is about linear algebra. You, you, if you want to prove it, you can. Earlier, it's U times a transpose. But at the end, I want to reverse it. When you reverse it, then it's a, the A transpose is being transposed again, so it goes back to A. So, partial derivative of U transpose G 
with respect to x equals to u and then multiply the uh, a transpose x minus b, right? So what happened was, because of the derivative, you have these two guys multiplying with each other because they both have transpose sign. When you time, when you put them together, you transpose them. So at the end, you have a times u. Okay, that's why you have a times u over there. So just for you to know, if you have no idea what's going on. Similarly, you have n times v, just similar derivation. Uh, over here, uh, at the last one is going to be negative w, and this equals to zero. Okay, so this is my, uh, I want to use red, did I use red? Yes, the red, another red box. This is a equality equation, okay? Based on gradient of Lagrangian equals to zero. Now, what else? Um, from KKT condition, we know uh, mu times g equals to zero. So over here, the, the KKT condition said uh, mu, so basically is u transpose g equals to zero. This is another equation from KKT condition. And also w x equals to zero. Because x part is also, we have two inequality, g and the last one. For inequality, earlier we said the multiplier times the inequality must be zero. That's what we had from KTK condition. So KTK condition implies UG equals to zero, WX equals to zero. So in this K, oh, and, and also KTK condition said the Lagrangian multiplier must be, be positive or zero. Here, W positive or zero, right? So that's what KD condition said. Uh, for U and W, I'm gonna use a red circle, circle them. And for X, this one, I will use a circle here. So from here, I'm going to draw some red boxes and also some red circles. They will be utilized later on. Okay? Now let's see what we are going to do. Uh, okay. This one this one, I'm going to circle it, uh, uh, draw a box. Why? Because W is a vector of values. X is your variable, like X1, X2, X3. So basically, this implies WX1 plus WX2 plus WX3 da, 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 equals to zero. It's a linear function. So. Whenever we find a linear function at the end, we will keep it. And we will draw a red box. How about the long one? hx plus c, this whole thing is actually a linear function. h are a bunch of coefficients. x is a one of the variable. c are coefficients. a are coefficients. u is a it is a bunch of variables, especially our um, Lagrangian multiplier. But they are variables. They are unknown variables. N are some values in the constraint. V 
are variables. W are variables. They are linearly placed together. So this is a linear function in terms of all the variables that we have, x, u, v, and w. Okay, so this is linear function uh, with respect to x, u, v, and w. Or in terms of, maybe that's the right way to say it. In terms of, so that's why we I red box it. I I need it later on. Now, how about U and G? U G that's plug in G. G is A transpose X minus B. This has to be zero. This is not linear. Because you have u times x, that becomes like an x squared. It's a nonlinear term. So this is not linear. That's why we don't draw a box onto it. Okay. Now let's see. In order to derive further, and in order to handle this uh, nonlinear equation at the end, we want to answer with a bunch of linear equations that is equivalent to our original problem. If we have one of the equations that we had at the beginning that is not being considered, at the final format, then we are missing something. We need to convert everything, having everything being taken care of and having them being described in the linear format so we can solve it like a linear programming. So this particular one is not handled yet. One way to handle this is to, again, our good friend introduce select variables introduce slack variables to a G equation. Right? So at the end, we will have G is A transpose X minus B. So here we are um, plug, having uh, adding slack variable as a vector equals to zero. And we want to make sure S is positive or zero. So when we introduce that, this one already will be uh, utilized later on. So this newly introduced select variables has to be positive or zero. And that transform our uh, uh, inequality equation into a linear format. So this will be utilized later on. Okay. So did we have, did we uh, cover everything? Uh, let me see. Did we cover everything? When we ah, okay. When we do the when we did the uh, gradient of Lagrangian equals to zero, we only work on the partial derivative with respect to x. We haven't covered the partial derivative with respect to other variables. So if we now uh, work on the partial derivatives 
with respect to other variables, we may need to talk about the one with uh, u, v, and w. Okay, and they need to be zero. When we do that, uh, let me see, Lagrangian. because we have done that in the first half of the lecture. That's why we, we were able to found uh, all the conditions right here. The number two and number three, they were determined, they were obtained based on the uh, partial derivative with respect to all the variables. That's the, the, that's the conclusion that we found. So, uh, we don't need to handle that anymore. Um, so we just need to make sure everything was covered. The uh, Lagrangian, yes, we have this one. And Lagrangian said, this is basically uh, Lagrangian rule number one, right? And this is rule number two. Number two, yeah, based on our numbering, yes. And basically this is rule number three. And we introduced select variables is because when when we talk about rule number two and we cannot handle the nonlinear equation right here, that's why we uh, decided to introduce select variables. Okay, so when we introduce select variables, um, it becomes a uh, ah okay, so. We can then go back to see what we had earlier. This is what we had uh, right here. This is what we had. Because that was the equation that we couldn't handle. So once we introduce select variable, we can go back and take a look. So revisit, revisit u times a transpose x minus b. So basically plug in. At the end we have something like this. We have some new equation. Okay, so this one uh, the the trouble oh Sorry, I should not use the same color. When we when I said w x equals to zero, actually w is a bunch of variables, x is a bunch of variables. That one is nonlinear. So uh, I'm gonna use the pink pink one, pink box. Okay, we keep it, but nonlinear. We, we need this equation, but this is a nonlinear relation. But we will keep it. So from here, we also get a nonlinear relationship because u times s. u is a bunch of variable, s is a bunch of select variables. Multiplying them each other, um, it's nonlinear. 
So this is a, a second nonlinear equation. Those two are equations that we don't, we cannot easily deal with. Okay, but at least those came from the second rule of KKT. Okay. Now there's something that we didn't uh, cover, we didn't handle. That is uh, the multiplier of V. V is the multiplier for equality constraint. So uh, we actually didn't mention too much when we talk about in the very beginning when we have linear ones. When we have this, we said, yeah, when we first have this, we said for equality constraints, we have this multiplier lambda. But we never t say, okay, what is lambda? So in fact, we don't want lambda to be zero because it's meaningless. So, so over here, lambda i, we don't want them to be zero. Because this is the equation describing how gradient f is parallel to gradient h. If lambda is zero, then it's meaningless. Okay? So over here, similarly, for the multiplier for the equality constraint, basically is v. We don't want v to be zero. So over here, uh, V cannot be zero. So how do we handle this equation? How do we? How can we make sure V is not zero? Um, there's one way. We will let uh, V equals to Y minus Z and equals to zero, and Y positive and Z positive. So. We allow two new vectors, and we, assu we, ass uh, we assume v equals to y vector minus v vector, and they equals to zero. Uh, when this is, oh, sorry, they are not equals to, they, they are not the same. So we, when we do that, then we have a equation like this that could be utilized in our later formulation is a linear description as long as um, you can find two vectors y and z and they are different then v will be properly defined by y and z some random y and z during the optimization process and as long as v vector is not zero then we're okay so we use two different vectors which are unknown and we allow the optimization process to determine their value as long as y and z are not the same, then we are fine. So this equation will be used and uh, we want them to be positive all the time because for linear programming, we want all the variables to be positive. Now, let's put everything together. Here is the first box, right here. First box, copy it, paste it here. So, to sum up. This is the first box. Uh, second box, I'm gonna pick up pick up this one second box okay then the third box I'm gonna pick up is this one Okay, then there are two pink boxes that we don't hand, we cannot handle well, but we still we, we still need to mention them. 
So one of the pink boxes here. The other one is this guy. And there is a, a, another one, which is V, this one, this one, paste it here, move this guy lower, move this guy to here, erase, okay, is that everything? Let me see. Da -da 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 -da. Ah, actually, we can, oops, sorry, we can move it, ah, uh, we can already plug in, replace, replace the V right here, so I'm gonna do that, so eraser, <coughs> move this, so plug in here. So we don't need V anymore. Okay. Just plug in. Okay? Yeah? Now let's take a look at all the variables that we 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 mentioned and circled by the the, the, the rest of code. Okay, first thing of course our X has to be positive. Okay. What else has to be positive? Um, all the Lagrangian multiplier. Okay, here we have this Lagrangian multiplier positive. Yes. How about V? We don't have V anymore. How about W? Yes. This part positive. And well, we we introduce select variables here. Positive as well. And uh, we introduce the Y and Z to describe the V Lagrangian multiplier. Now, to clean up. So, we have a bunch of linear equations. Uh, these three are linear, and this is telling us all the variables are positive, positive or zero variables, and these two are some kind of nonlinear relationship we cannot handle at this point. Okay, then then what else? We try to write them in a, a newer form, okay? Uh, how do we do that? We need some space here. Uh, you will need some space. Six columns. Okay. And here all the variables. Okay. And here you will have three rows. Okay, three rows. Now I'm going to rewrite everything into this matrix form and I'm gonna put exactly what we had from the top but put it in this matrix form. So over here we're going to uh, describe the second equation right here. So here is your A transpose times X minus B, so B can be on the right hand side and then plus S S is the fourth variable, so here it is basically uh, actually identity, because it's a matrix. Matrix times S. How do you keep the S? It's like a one times S, but identity matrix times S. 
and it gives you else. So, what is this? Ax is the Ax here. Minus b is, this is minus b, going to the right hand side of the equation. Times s, so basically i times s. I, what is identity matrix? Basically like this. The, all the diagonal terms are ones. So at the end it's s. Okay, so this is the first, uh, the second equation. So the rest are just zeros, the zeros. Okay, now, uh, second row, I'm going to describe the third equation in transpose, and then minus E, so on the right-hand side, positive E, and the rest are just zeros. Okay, the third row, handling the first equation right there on the top, Hagian times X, plus C, so move to the right-hand side, negative C. A times U, so A times U here. N times Y, so N times Y. Minus N times Z. Negative W, so negative I times W. That's the final form. Let me just double check with my earlier notes. Let me double check. Da, 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 da. I, I, during the holiday, I was not taking a rest. I was trying to derive this whole thing. Um, yep, yep, yep. Okay, great. Sh eh, hold on, double checking. Yes, correct. Now, so we end up with something like this, a huge, huge matrix. So over here, we are going to rename this whole thing. We're going to call this a big B matrix times, this is a big X vector equals to some D vector here. <coughs> so at the end, you will have big B times big X minus D equals to zero and also all the x are positive right because all the variables are positive and of course there are two e equations that we didn't handle which is w transpose x equals to zero and u transpose s equals to zero so at the end the entire uh, Nonlinear problem was uh, at the end becoming something like this. If we can find a set of variables that satisfy the whole thing, what does it mean? That means these variables are satisfying the KKT conditions. So as long as we can find a set of variables that satisfy the whole thing, that's the optimal solution. So now I'm going to tell you how we can, how how can we do that? So then, this method is a, 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 there's no names. I googled. I, I was trying to find what's the name of this method. It's like a, a, a two-phase approach. Two-phase approach. Okay. And. So in the, this unique phase, you are solving a completely different problem. And when we get the solution, that's the solution for the original phase. So it's like an additional problem that, is, that 
allows you to find the solution for the first place. So what do we do that? What, what do we do? We're going to minimize something like this, the summation of capital Y, okay? Subject to this large B, large X, minus D, plus Y, I'll tell you what those are, and then all the X and all the Y's are positive. So what is this? It's a Y, basically Y, uh, it's, a, it's a vector. So I should say y equals to um, capital Y1, capital Y2, da da da, capital Y and some, I will we'll talk about the dimension later, so just keep it like this. So I should rewrite this in this way, summation of all the y's, okay? I should put an index. So we have i j let me i j k maybe i j k l m n o p. Do we use p? Maybe use p. So the index I'm gonna use p. So here uh, we have capital Y of P and more, okay? Just the index. Uh, I will tell you how many of them. So for here it's like a summation of all the Y P. So what what was this? Uh, if you take a look, it's actually like this. Um, take a look at this problem. It's a linear matrix times x. Uh, ah, I should. Uh, it's uh, it's like this. We had the super large B and a bunch of x, right? We had this. And we're going to put the d on the right-hand side. So this is the original linear problem. But over here, we are adding y1, y2, and all the y's. And we're going to solve this by linear programming. We are treating these as the uh, basic variables. And we are treating all of these as non-basic. Why do we do that? <coughs> so, if you're treating all the y's as basic, they are non-zero. So your left-hand side, the bx, basically is zero. This part is zero. This part is zero. So at the end, as a starting point, you have uh, y1 equals the first coefficient here, y2 equals to the second coefficient here. You, you will have a bunch of y's that satisfy this equation. Okay? And, but that doesn't help us. That doesn't help us to figure out what's, what are the x. But think about linear programming. Linear programming is trying to uh, minimize the FG function. So at the beginning, you will have a bunch of y's summing together. They are not zero. They are basically the sum of all the coefficients on the right-hand side. 
And when, if you solve this problem with the linear programming, the y's will eventually become non-basic. So originally they are non-zero, they will eventually become zero. So when all the y's are zero, this problem will converge because you cannot improve anymore. But when you use linear programming, you find all the y's becoming zero, you will have a bunch of x that are not zero anymore. So at the end, these becoming zero and these become non-zero. So what does that mean? You will end up with some solution at the end that satisfy this whole thing equals to the right hand side and here is zero. So what's, what, what does that mean? What you get at the end is satisfy bx equals to d. What does the solution satisfy bx equals to d mean? That means you satisfy this. So you just satisfy KKT condition. So with this additional phase, it's a, a kind of approach help you to find the solution that is satisfying the equality condition in the phase one. And that's what you want. You want some solution that is satisfying the KKT condition. That's how you solve it. And you may be concerned, hey, can we just do this? X equals to B inverse D. Can we do this? Obviously not, because the size of B is not a square matrix. So if you try to solve this by uh, uh, D square approximation, you may end up with some solution that not exactly matching this equation. That means that solution is not exactly the optimal. So D square approximation doesn't help you. But this way could be helping. Unfortunately, the solution from the second phase doesn't guarantee these two equations are satisfied. So, and also linear programming has some issues. I, in my own testing, I found some issues. But uh, uh, at least it's one approach. I just I, I programmed this last week. It works. I will show you the program. But uh, um, it's not perfect all the time. There will be some problems that will lead to some ill condition uh, situation for linear programming. So the linear programming cannot converge. If the linear programming cannot converge, then you cannot solve it. You cannot solve the QP. Or when you converge for linear programming and at the end, the two nonlinear ones are not satisfied, it's not KKT also. So it's not perfect, but for simple problems in my program, in my code, it works. Uh, I guess that's why in the literature or in the textbook, or even in MATLAB, in many other uh, open uh, resources, there are so many other ways to solve this problem. This is not the only way to solve it. This two-phase approach is just one of the one of the approach. Okay, so now let's try to take a look at the MATLAB code that I just programmed. Um, oh, doesn't. I programmed during the weekend. Before I move on to my code, I need to let you know some of the issues I found. So let me show you the notes I had. Uh, it's more complex <laughs> right here. So there will be situation. I I I I decided not to talk about this one in the class because it's even more complex than what I just told you. So what are the situations? Sometimes when we have uh, equality constraints like this, 
we may have positive B or we may have negative B. And it turns out when we have this uh, huge integration on the right hand side of the huge matrix, it turns out in some of the form, in, in the uh, negative B part, on the right hand side we will have negative B. And you know for the linear programming we don't like the right hand side to be negative. So in this case you need to put negative sign all the way in order to make sure the right hand side is positive. So that's why uh, sometimes the mathematical derivation in the textbook is not general enough so over here in my uh, uh, this part of the notes, I separate the equations into two kinds: one with positive b one, uh, positive b, basically b one, and the other others are negative b's. So overall, uh, when you put things together, um, uh, you will you won't see. Uh, box that easily. And also for the um, select variables I noticed sometimes we need to use sort of cross variables. Okay, so uh, because uh, B2 is uh, B2 is negative so for the B2 case we are actually introducing surplus variables. So there are S1 and S2. S1 is, um, let me see. No, I think both are select variables, is it? Yeah, both are select variables. I just named them in a different way. Uh, what's troublesome part is the huge one. The uh, huge matrix, I noticed when CI is positive, we need a negative sign everywhere. So over here you will see when I combine together, uh, I put, <coughs> I introduce some new variable called sign. Capital, this, this is not sign variable, it's like a capital S. This is the sign of C. Because uh, for positive C or negative C, this line may be uh, may need a multiplier of negative one. So it took me some time to figure out what is the more general way to write this. It turns out if you put a, ne a, a sign of C right here and with some of the negative, some are positive, then everything is right. So anyway, this part. Uh, it took me some time to figure out, and that's what, what I have. I will give this to you, so if you are interested, you can look into it. So uh, over here, I use the two-phase method, and it works. Um, huh. uh, some of the notes were... screwed up. Well, I didn't know what I, what happened. So basically, here is uh, some of the y y's. Yep. Anyway, let me show you the map code, and we can call it the day. So let me. So MATLAB
Okay, uh, I think I need to hold on. This is my there's a software I need to turn off. that one is off. But how come it's... Maybe I turn on too many softwares. Uh, maybe I pause the synchronize. Uh, let me restart. Maybe I can turn off Photoshop. Okay, I think it's okay. Now I think I have a main function here. Okay, so this is my main problem. I'm not sure if this one works. So let me solve it, because I, I try different problems and uh, I think this one will fail. Let me see. Well, this one works. Uh, let me turn on the equality. So this code is actually a sequential code. It will sequentially solve the problem. Okay, now, let's take a look what's going on. I have nonlinear problems. So this is, a, I have a sine cosine here, so it's nonlinear. If you take a look at uh, the objective function contour, you can see during the iteration, the contour change its shape a little bit because every time I am doing second order Taylor expansion when I move to a new position I'm doing the expansion again and since the original function is nonlinear so the approximated function will be slightly different at different expansion point so uh, this is my ability function I made several constraints. Over here in my code, because of MATLAB, the way I, I, uh, I want to make the drawing more effectively, I need to have functions that include x1 and x2 all the time. But if I have function like this, this means x1 must be smaller than or equals to 10. But for MATLAB, it's uh, only a function of x1, there's no x2. So sometimes for drawing and for, for some of the uh, derivations, lacking x2 makes the MATLAB code harder to run. So I will add one x2 with a very tiny multiplier, 10 to the power of negative 6. So 
it's almost zero, and it doesn't. The purpose of having this is just to uh, to make my code uh, running more smoothly, but uh, it doesn't change the value much. So here's one uh, tiny coefficient in front of x2, another one in front of x1, and here's another one. This is tiny, tiny value in front of x1. Here's a, um, I don't know, I don't remember why I did this. I think this one is not tiny, this one. This 10 to the power of negative 3 will make this line like tilt a little bit. Okay, anyway, um, let me show you what, maybe I will pause right here. Oh, it doesn't plot. The plotting is in here. Let me show you when I have the plot. Okay, run the code. So before I run the uh, QP and linear programming code, this is what we I had earlier. Um, maybe I should show you where is my expansion point. Where did I plot the point? Let me find where I plot the point. Uh, plot. This is plotting the cons. Oh, here. So maybe I can. Okay. Huh, huh. So this is my initial guess. Okay. And before I jump into here, I actually made several Taylor expansions in the code. Um, I will have Taylor expansions on F, on, on the uh, all the constraints, and the red one is the equality constraint. Even for the equality constraint, we, we need to make a linear approximation. So the green line is the linear approximation of the red equality. And over here, you can see the Arjuna function is having a different shape uh, compared to the original shape. And uh, I, the code was quite long. Uh, let me show you here, up to here. So I am solving a linear programming problem, just like the second, uh, the second, uh, the two-phase approach. So let me open the linear programming code and jump into here. You can see this is for linear programming. We have a C vector, A vector, and B vector. C vector basically is a bunch of uh, coefficient in front of a variable. And over here you can see how come all the coefficients are 0 and then 1, 1, 1, 1, because this is the y1, y2, y3 until the last y. Oh, for the second uh, two-phase problem, we have the arbitrary function has no x. The algebraic function only has all the y's. The, uh, we can call them dummy variables. They are just created for us to find the optimal solution. So they are the y's. How about A matrix? OK, A matrix is wrong. OK, so over here, uh, I think on the left of this part, basically exactly what I derived for the super big B times X. So this part is the big B. And on the right, basically the uh, Y variables 
for two phase. So all the diagonal terms of ones. So this is y1 equals to the small b vector, uh, the d vector. Uh, y2 equals to the second one of d. Y3 equals to the small one of, uh, of, of, of d. Uh, how about the d vector? d vector in linear programming basically is a b. So uh, here are some coefficients that you got from the huge derivation. So over here, uh, this is basically linear programming. You, you know about this, right? Basically linear programming code, okay? But I think I uh, fine tune a little bit so that it fits what I want to do. So, uh, after it converts, it will um, stop right here. Let's finish the code and then stop right here. Once it's solved, it actually finds the right position. Magically. Did I check? Did I check this? Um, did I check? So, so to be honest, did I check? Did I check? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, did I check this, these two? I didn't. I should, but I didn't. So my code was now 100% done. It's not perfect. I didn't check those. So to be correct, I need to check whether my solution satisfy these two. But what if it doesn't satisfy? This method doesn't tell us what you can do after if, if it doesn't satisfy. So um, that's why in the literature there are so many other methods. So I guess in my example, I was lucky. Uh, I, at the end, I, he found the solution. So over here, uh, when when we start from here, I did second order Taylor expansion for constraint uh, for f. I did linear pro, uh, linear Taylor expansion for all the uh, uh, equality and inequality constraints, and then formulate that big matrix. Formulate this guy. Formulate the b x minus d, and then introduce the two phase. So I have b x plus a diagonal uh, uh, terms of y one y two until the last y, and I move the d to the right hand side. So solve this linear programming problem like I showed you earlier. And at the end, we hope all the y's are zero. So the variables will satisfy this part, the, fr the front part. And based on KKT, that, is sh that should be the optimal solution. I did that. And in the code, it shows that you are able to find a solution right here by human observation. Um, for all the black lines, they are inequality constraints. Each of them has a gray arrow. The arrow is showing the, uh, the, the, the half that is feasible. So this area, this direction is feasible. This direction is feasible. So from the, the uh, black boundaries, this region, is the feasible space. Inside the feasible space, you want to stay on the red curve. And for the agility function, blue means lower, red means higher. So by human observation, this intersection between the red curve and this black line is the optimal because that should be the position with the lowest agility function value. But because uh, the, the uh, red curve was nonlinear, so when we started to make a approximation right here, 
we only had a blue uh, a green green boundary like this. So uh, we we could we, we cannot know the nonlinear function is actually here. We thought this was here. So uh, this is the first iteration. We need to do the Taylor expansions again to see if we have converged. That's why sequentially we move on to the next iteration. In the next iteration, based on the new point, the Taylor expansion of the red curve become more accurate. The red curve is closer to the true position. So we will be solving the linear programming by the new linearized boundary. And we solve everything again. So once it's solved, you can see it's moving to the intersection between the green and the black. So there is still a tiny gap because the, the approximation from here only give us this much accuracy. So we probably need to do another round of approximation until this is close enough. So it really depends on how accurate you want the solution is. So if we continue again, one more round. And let's see if the... Did you see the green line is almost overlapping with the red? There's an even more accurate green line. So it's very, very close. So let's continue again. Did it converge? It didn't because the error between the error between these two points are still too large, not yet uh, converging. So I guess one more round we will having a linear approximation of this green line very close to the earlier one. So I think in this particular iteration we will converge. So continue. So linear programming. So over here you almost it's this tight. Okay. So as long as these two are close enough, then we converge. I think we did. Yeah, converge. Okay. So that's what happened. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, it's a uh, hundred lines of codes. Linear programming, thirty something. So quadratic programming is uh, more complex. So I don't want to use the class time to program because that will take too long. So that's it for today. Uh, ah, I should give you homework. What do I do? Uh, Maybe try to solve a very simple problem. I should give you homework. Uh, so try to solve minimize x1 square plus x2, oh, maybe 10 times x2 square. So I've got 2. Let's see. <coughs> Let me get some inspiration from here. Uh, maybe you can do um, uh, maybe a horizontal line. I, th I think this line is good. That line would be. Uh, Let me double check. Here, okay. 
<coughs> okay. Uh... Okay. <coughs> okay. That that's the one. So I will change the value a little bit. So first one. So the minus x1 minus 5x2 uh, plus 12 smaller than 0 okay <coughs> so one constraint like this so let me get a <coughs> equality constraint like this so let me make sure what I'm giving you is right. So let me just copy, get rid of those. And I'm giving you negative 5, and here is 12. I'm not going to use this one. This one's OK. Uh, here I will say I don't need this. X two, okay. And uh, I will need one equality constraint. That is <coughs> um, something like this. So. Uh, x2 equals to 3x1, maybe minus 2. So if I'm doing this, so x2 minus 3 times x1 plus 2. Okay, let me see if it works. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that. It should work uh, for the uh, PD function, of course. Uh, ten times, right? Ten times of this. The solution process will look like this. Boom. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should uh, introduce something based on your student ID again. So let me um, mine. Let me see. Minus. Oh, uh, here is plus two. How about zero? <coughs> Okay, this one works. Uh, okay, how about minus 9? Okay, yeah, it works. So, last digit, last digit of student ID. Yeah, and then here. Uh, your initial gas equals to 5 and last digit of what goes from 0 to 1. Oh, of your weight. <laughs> okay. Let me try. Uh, if I go from five zero, it's right here. 
should be solid mode. No, not solid mode because it so cannot be last digit of your weight. So here's the situation. <laughs> The initial point is not feasible, so it's not giving us good solution. Uh, how about five plus? Um, how about ten? How about is ten okay? Five ten should be okay. No, it's uh, so it, it's just, just lucky. Maybe from eight, eight is better. I don't want you to bump into some process that doesn't give you a good solution. So here I will say 8, um, 4 plus 5 divided, uh, no. One half of last digit of your your your, your hopes or your weight. Okay. If you do this, so minimum is four. Eight and four. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not good. Mm. How about yes. five five? Five and five is here. Okay. So if this is zero, it should be five. Let me try all the digits just to make sure everyone gets a. Ah, no, it's not solvable. Yeah. So, five, six? No. Maybe I'll just give you some number that's solvable. Self measurable. So uh, here I'm gonna use some. Tr let's try some numbers and make sure it works. Okay, this one works. So from five five and yeah. So this is the. This is the problem. So um, solve by QP with two-phase approach. Basically, a linear programming approach. That's going to work. And I will give you the code. Actually, I will give you like this. If you run the code, that's the solution. But I want you to write down the detail of the deliberation. So how did you get, how did you get this? Just write down the format. So if you have no idea what's going on, you can go through my my code line by line and figure out. Ah, right here, the professor did this and did that, so that it ends up with the big B X minus D plus y equals to zero. How do you write that down? So go, go through with my code, you should be able to figure out what happened. I hope. Okay, and I tested it, it works. It works in my program. So you should be able to get a solution. Try it uh, by yourself. Uh, do I have an exam for this? Uh, I, I'll think about it. If we don't have new exams, then your score is almost set.
right now because uh, because of some of my poor scheduling, we only have two exams. And uh, at the beginning, I said one exam is like 15 points, so totally is 30. And um, giving you homework today, I will be I will be collecting next time. So I'm supposed to collect right here next week. So the total of the homework is only 10 points. Uh, now we are in a total of 85. Because I removed two of the exams, I think. Or I, I've, I think I removed one of the exams and removed some of the homework. Because I uh, it's like a to be determined. Uh, so... Do you want to have an exam? Take home exam again? But you know, this part of the exam is very challenging. Even for the code, sometimes it doesn't work. So I, I don't have the confidence to give you a well-conditioned exam. <laughs> um, how about this? We don't do an exam. We, uh, you can uh, do a case study of quadratic programming. Just go, into, go to the internet to find is, is there any other ways to solve for quadratic programming. Treat it as an exam. How do you think? Okay, let's do a floating. If, if we do not do exams anymore, I need to increase the percentage. So if you didn't do well last time, then you, you will get lower points. So one option is no more exams. For myself, I don't want exams anymore. It's taking my time. Second option is we still do an exam, take home exam. So, uh, professor needs to create a quadratic programming problem for you to, to, to work on, and the problem has to be solvable. So that will be, I, will, I need to spend some time to define good problems. The, uh, the third option is, let's use a, literature review and write a short report to and, and then consider it as a exam score. Same score, like 15. What do you think? So let's do voting. Everyone votes, okay? Um, no exam. Second, uh, QP take home. Third, Review and report. Are you guys ready? <laughs> uh, who votes for no more exam? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, raise your hand straight, straight, straight up, straight up. Okay. Sixteen. Okay. So I, I guess this wins. Uh, who wants to do exam? Who wants to do review? Three? <laughs> okay. So no more exams. Okay. So in that case, I will I will increase. How about this? I increase those to twenty. So then we have ninety-five, and I can have three points for each homework. Then that's a hundred. How about that? Okay. Okay? You guys okay? Yes. Everyone okay? Everyone happy? Or maybe too much for the exam. How about 
a little bit to the project. So if I do that, I can have, uh, for example, 18 here, 18 there. So four more, four more, so maybe 12 here, 27 here. How about this? So it's more balanced. Okay? Okay, that's it. So, that's it for today. If you have questions, you can come here. Okay, bye bye. Oh, by the way, this is already the most difficult part of this course. No more difficult one. Later on in the uh, second half, it's, I think they are easier, in my opinion. So, no. I think the pressure now goes to your own project. Okay. I graded two person. They all did very well. One person got 100. So I think maybe you guys are good. Oh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I haven't finished all, all of them yet. No, I'm very busy. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs>